Welcome. I'm Ash. I do event coordination for Firestorm Books and Coffee. And I'm really looking forward to hosting today's discussion on Shane Burley's latest work, Why We Fight, Essays on Fascism, Resistance, and Surviving the Apocalypse. Uh, Shane will be joined in conversation by Natasha Leonard and Talia Laven, two writers with their own experiences researching and covering aspects of contemporary far-right movements, white supremacy, and fascist resurgence in the world today, along with some ideas on what to do about it. Our hope is that this conversation can offer valuable insights to those listening today and in the future. For folks attending an event with us for the first time, uh, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a 13-year-old worker-owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, on occupied Cherokee territory. Our bookstore features a wide selection of general interest titles and political thought with a focus on queer, feminist, and anarchist voices and culture as well as an extensive children's and middle grade section that most folks might not expect from a radical bookstore. Um, we're also an event space that hosts a wide range of workshops, film screenings and presentations, as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations. Since the start of the pandemic, we transitioned our events to an online virtual space um, and will likely continue with virtual events through the end of the year. Much of our ability to host free and accessible programming like this depends on our community sustainers program, uh, which we actually just revamped on Patreon. So if folks are interested in supporting our work and getting some useful discounts and perks in return, I'll drop a link in the chat and you should check it out. Uh, also, after 15 months of closure, it feels really good to share that our doors are now open to the public four days a week, Friday through Monday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, so if you're local or if you want to take a trip to come check us out, you can totally do that now. Uh, and we would love to see you. In the meantime, we continue to sell books online through our website, which I will also drop a link to in the chat in the comments. Um, one last note before introducing our speakers, uh, there will be some time at the end of the event for audience Q&A. So for folks who are attending through Zoom, I'll encourage you to submit questions throughout the discussion by using the Q&A fun function located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we'll do our best to respond to them by the end of today's event. Okay, cool. Uh, so on to the conversation. Like I said before, we're here today for a discussion related to Shane Burley's latest work, Why We Fight, published by AK Press. Um, Why We Fight is a collection of essays, covering the resurgence of the far right, as well as the explosion of anti-fascist, anti-racist, and revolutionary organizing that has risen to fight it. The essays unpack the moment we live in, confronting the apocalyptic feelings brought on by nationalism, climate collapse, and the crisis of capitalism, but also delivering the clear message that a new world is possible through the struggles communities are leveraging today. Um, so if you've not had a chance to check it out yet, it's an incredibly valuable read. Uh, so I hope that you will, and I'll drop links to it in the chat as well. Um, so for our speaker, Shane Burley is a writer and filmmaker and author of Fascism Today, What It Is and How to End It, also from AK Press. Their work has appeared in The Baffler, The Independent, Jacobin, Truth Out, Alternate, and Waging Nonviolence. Natasha Leonard is a contributing writer for The Intercept, and her work has appeared regularly in The New York Times, The Nation, Esquire, Vice, and Salon, among many others. She teaches critical journalism at the New School for Social Research, and she is the author of Being Numerous, 
a collection of essays that offer a clear and honest interrogation of what it means to fight fascism and live a non-fascist life. Talia Laban is a writer who has had bylines in The New Yorker, The New Republic, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, among many others. She is the author of Culture Warlords, My Journey into the Dark Web of White Supremacy, uh, which took her on a deep dive into the online culture of hate and the intricacies of how white supremacy proliferates online. So Shane, Natasha, Talia, thank you so much for being here today and taking the time to offer us this dialogue. And I will go ahead and hand it over to Shane. Well, thanks so much, Ash. Um, I wanna thank Firestorm. Um, it's great, I'm, we were just talking about this ahead of time. It's really great that we have the virtual events where we can actually uh, support independent bookstores. Um, it's been really, really hard over the pandemic. So feel free to order um, from the website. Um, they get a little shipping out and also uh, drop donations into the Eventbrite to support the speakers. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Talia and Natasha. Thank you so much for being here. We're all in different time zones, some of us in different countries. And so uh, this is a nice opportunity we wouldn't be able to do in person. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about where I came from with the book. And then what we're going to do is kind of have a conversation. We'll talk back and forth, maybe about where our work overlaps, but also just what this year feels like coming maybe out of the pandemic, partially out of the pandemic, but also kind of continuing what the last few years has been like. I, when I was putting together the book, I was thinking about what I had worked on over the last few years, all basically during the Trump years. I think the earliest thing in the book starts in 2017, and a lot of the essays are brand new, um, particularly the longest ones that close out the book. Um, and it was a feeling of anxiety. It was something that was really uncomfortable in my gut. And it brought me back to when I was growing up in advance of the millennium. I think my first actual panic attack happened at about seven years old, thinking about the end of the world and thinking about particularly the biblical uh, story that was being told in church. My father is Jewish, my mom was Christian, we went to a Presbyterian church. And there's this kind of religious terror that captured me, particularly um, when I, we had moved to a kind of smaller town and there's a mega church nearby. And that was sort of the, the, the narrative that had started to creep up in advance of the millennium. So through starting in 1995, 96, 97, it only kind of built up more. And so when particularly, obviously during the Trump years, but when we ramped up really into 2020, I started having the same feeling and feeling like maybe it was a bit of the same story. Um, and so when I was actually actively working on the book, I was putting everything together. We had just, the pandemic was in full force, but here in Portland, we had hit this massive wave of forest fires. Um, so I think about 12 to 13% of Oregon was on fire. There's, there's no precedent for this before. There's been forest fires for years, but not like this. And it had basically encaptured the entire air with smoke. And people probably saw these photos of the sky had turned blood red and totally overwhelmed. Those were not filters. It was actually like that. We had the worst air quality in the world for that period of time. We couldn't step outside without, I had to use a gas mask. Um, but then I realized I already had the gas mask because I had been getting gas from the, the Portland police for the last few years. I already had the gloves and things because we were in the middle of the pandemic. All these things felt like they had sort of collapsed on each other. And it reminded me again of that feeling when I was growing up and a, story, and a, a situation I had with a friend of mine who went to an even more conservative church than I did who was often talking about the end of the world and talking about, you know, symbols that we might look for. You know, maybe there would be a, a figure who would rise in the Middle East. Maybe there would be, you know, Russia would acquire nuclear weapons or there would be a blood red moon. And of course the sky was covered in kind of a, a deep sickening blood red. So it was felt, it felt like I was part of that, that same story. But what really I think changed it was that we felt incredibly capable during it. So, you know, when we started the pandemic, there was absolutely no state response. The state was completely incapable of dealing with things. There was no like national health care response. There was nothing. We were really on our own. But people really built infrastructure, mutual aid network stuff really, really quickly. 
And then when the protests uh, sparked in response to the murder of George Floyd, those mutual aid networks, they all of a sudden moved and started supporting the protests. And then when the fires started happening, the groups that were around the protests started supporting um, uh, the, the communities hit by the forest fire. And that's continued to steamroll. And so in a way, the story of the end of the world and the story of the apocalypse, at least the anxiety has been really met with people in a way I didn't think was possible before. And so, with thinking about the idea of the apocalypse, I actually felt really hopeful when working on the book. Um, and it also made clear, so clear, why anti-fascism was the central piece of that. And that's the central theme of this book. It's the central theme of a lot of, of what I work on. Because in this crisis period, uh, I think Robert Paxson calls it mobilizing passions, the things that really affect people's life. There are multiple futures that are possible. And the far right are actually actively working and have energy and money and a force to change that future, to pick that future for us. And so anti-fascism is sort of at the center of what survival actually would be like. We're building mutual aid networks, but we also have that, the defensive piece as well. So I guess I wanted to kick it over by asking people how they first became an anti-fascist, which when I was writing it down, felt like the stupidest question I could think of. Why would someone have to choose that? But in a way, we're being forced the choice, the situation's forcing the choice. So was there an event in your life? Was there something that you feel like actually drew you out to have to make a public stance on that? And if Talia, you wanna kick it off? Yeah, um, and just uh, first I wanna say, um, Thanks so much for having me, uh, Firestorm, and um, excited to be here. And um, I really love Shane's book. It, it, it has such a granular level of detail, but really gracefully put together in a way that's, you know, not difficult to read, but really draws you into sort of the, the, the level of obsessive detail that you really need to get into uh, in order to uh, effectively fight these movements. Um, and so, it, you know, I really enjoyed the book in that way. And, and then I'm honored to be here to, pr to promote it. Um, I mean, to answer the question, I, so I also have a Jewish background. Um, I, my, both my parents are, are, are Jews and, and my, uh, my mother's parents were Holocaust survivors. Um, so that was always a big part of my family's story growing up. And I think, um, I had this sense of kind of, okay, you know, we, we survived this horror in Europe, we've come to America, and now, you know, as the sort of third generation, um, we were making good, we were living the American dream, I went to Harvard, like, everything's totally copacetic and, 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 and great as a Jew in America. And, and I, I was, a, you know, on the left, but but to be honest, for a lot of my early adult life, I wasn't tremendously politically engaged and um, unfortunately, um, for, you know, and, and unfortunately in a way that, that causes me a lot of shame thinking backwards, um, just how kind of naive and, and self-absorbed self I was. And, and um, so a couple of things changed that. So um, some of my, er my earliest jobs in, uh, in journalism were at Jewish publications. And one of my first jobs was moderating the comments at the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, JTA, the, the Newswire. And um, that was really my first experience with pretty brutal online anti-Semitism. It was just like, and I also monitored the traffic for our newsletters and noticed that um, like stormfront.org, the new Nazi site was often the top driver of traffic, um, which was sort of wild to me. And I was like, oh, anti-Semitism still here. And it's, it's big. It's, and, and 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 they're really violent. Like they, they keep talking about wanting to dismember our columnists. That's pretty crazy. Uh, and then of course all those emotions got kicked into high gear in the Trump era, and um, particularly um, the uh, the events at, at um, Charlottesville. I, I also wanted to say it's particularly apropos that we're having this panel today on what I consider to be a pretty sacred and holy day. Today, the Confederate monuments at Charlottesville came down. Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, uh, and a really racist portrayal of Sacagawea hiding behind Lewis and Clark, crouching behind them in a subservient way, they all came down. And that's a beautiful moment that people have bled for, died for. And so, you know, that's just something I wanna note and, 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 um, and you know, shout out to 
to the many community organizers who worked so hard to make that happen. Um, but yeah, that, that, that moment with, I mean, and this is a little bit cliche, but, or maybe silly, but um, those, that moment with the tiki torches, the, the Jews will not replace us. I was watching from afar. Um, but that was a moment that shook up a lot of my assumptions, my tranquility, my, oh, it's all okay to be a Jew in America. <laughs> um, and that was a moment where I was like, I, I think there was like a break in my life where I was like, I'm going to look into this. I'm going to look deeply. And I wrote my first article on the far right, um, specifically on the Daily Stormer quest for a web host, um, where I compared them to wandering Jews because um, <laughs> they couldn't find a stable web host uh, um, a few months after. And I really haven't looked back. Actually, well, they were, then they wrote an article saying that my, my Jewish hideousness would, um, would prompt a real Holocaust or whatever, which is Nazi nonsense, but it made me more stubborn. I, I wasn't scared away. In fact, the reverse, I'm, I'm a very stubborn person. And I was just like, oh, okay. Now I'm going to dedicate um, years of my life to making your life worse. <laughs> So I guess that's how I got into it, yeah. Yeah, so I can uh, I can uh, add to that. And from a, a slightly different uh, framework, I'm, I'm actually in London now. I'm at my mum's my house. Um, I live in Brooklyn, but I'm staying with my mum for a bit, having not seen her for a while because of the pandemic. And um, yeah, so my, my introduction to like uh, anti-fascism came through as I think it almost necessarily does through through anti-capitalist activism. Um, I was involved in, in Occupy in New York um, and we didn't use the word fascism and talk a lot about fascism then. And the framework was not a fascism versus anti-fascism question, but um, as I, I believe that, that, that Talia and, and Shane um, would agree. And I know from Shane's really, really brilliant book. And, and yes, I should say thank you for having us, Firestorm. And I was so honored to be asked by uh, Shane to write the forward for this brilliant essay collection. Um, and I think what, what Shane addresses really well um, and that, that kind of speaks to why I was invested in talking about anti fascism um, is that, you know, you can't talk about anti fascism without talking about anti capitalism. Um, and Brecht made this point in the mid thirties that, you know, it, it makes no sense to talk about anti-fascism without talking about the capitalism from whence it's birthed. Um, I'm going to butcher the quote, but it's an important one um, in, in its kind of essence. So even if I but butcher it, I hope that the, the proposition comes across that um, people who are anti-fascist or claim to be anti-fascist without wanting to talk about the capitalism, the, the, the notions of colonialist modernity from whence it's birthed, um, they're a bit like the, the, the meat eater that doesn't want to see the butcher breaking up the cow, but is happy to have their steak. So not understanding the kind of the structural frameworks that, that create the conditions of possibility for fascist desirous spaces the nationalisms, the formations of the nation state, the, the assumptions of them, and the, the hierarchies and power structures of the racial capitalism under which we all live, um, participate and do uh, less or more to perpetuate. Um, you know, if we don't think about those things, then we're not gonna deal very well with challenging the fascism that births, that is birthed by by those structures. So yeah, I was I was part of, of Occupy um, and have lived in New York since and ha was at, um, you know, covered the legal cases following Standing Rock and a lot of the kind of state oppression that has been enacted on the, the communities and groups of people who have been on the front lines of trying to fight fascist creep before Trump. So, you know, the, the Trump years um, were horrifying and Charlottesville um, was one of those inflection points of, and I think it was indeed Shane who makes the point of like this notion that there could be a, a before and after Charlottesville, but yet 
the the kind of frameworks that that led to it um far pre-existed trump and indeed continue afterwards it was not an aberration but an outgrowth um yeah so i don't know my 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 path into um anti-fascist work came from anti-capitalist work and anti-racist work which makes total sense because how else will we address this if we treat it as some sort of aberration as opposed to an outgrowth um and yeah and it's also a weird thing to be like oh i anti-fascist um because it's it's a weird identity right like none of us are totally free from fascist preoccupation fascist desires this weird relation to power that we all have um so i like to think of it as like a verb like we do anti-fascisting um as opposed to being able to be like hi me anti-fascist doing it really well because i'm sure a lot of the way we're able to live and continue um, entails a certain sort of um, sets of oppression. Um, so it's about the kind of the practices, for me at least, and I, I know for my co-speakers here, um, yeah, the sort of practices that we can engage in that, that work against that, rather than feeling comfortably like I'm living an anti-fascist life all the time because I'm, I'm sure I'm not um but yeah so uh it was it was a a, a life path from occupy and anti-capitalism through to the relation that it necessarily has to anti-fascism a bit rambling sorry I feel like I had I encountered a lot of indifference when these sorts of threats came up over the years so I, I was trying to think about like my earliest situation and I um, when I was an undergraduate at University of Oregon, this must have been maybe 2005 or 2006, um, I was walking across campus one night and this woman in a tickle uh, approached me and said, hey, there's a speaker going on inside right now who denies the Holocaust and said it was invented by Zionists. Um, and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. And I saw, you know, people are handing out flowers, no one cared, there was no protests. And when I looked into it, it wasn't the first one. This, there had been a group at the U of O called the Pacifica Forum that had been hosting anti-Semitic and neo-Nazi speakers for a long time. Um, Volksfront members were on, on campus right then, were coming past all of us and no one seemed to care much about it, including like open swastika tattoos and things like that. And I sort of fast forward when I was uh, living in upstate New York, and this actually would have been about maybe right before Occupy or right, right when uh, that kind of people were being pulled into organizing. Um, uh, David Irving, kind of famed Holocaust denier historian, was having an event over like in Syracuse, which is maybe about 45 minutes away. And so we were David at, Irving. Yeah. Yeah. The, like he, it was very clear who he was. It was being hosted by far right groups. So one of them was like the European Heritage Society and like various other kind of like proto alt right groups, pre alt right groups. Um, and it was incredibly clear to the hotel that was hosting him what he was saying, but they refused to shut it down. They said that like, you know, it gives them more attention uh, than it's worth. Um, they intervened, like when, when uh, uh, folks showed up to intervene on the event, they called the cops and forced them out. Um, and then a, a couple of years later, I was trying to write a first article on Richard Spencer. This would have been 2014. And the article basically said, I think this guy could build a movement um, and that there could even be political power involved in you know, maybe the edges of it. There could be like a far right political movement. And I got a note back from an editor that said, I'm really sorry, Shane, uh, but this would never happen. No one's ever gonna hear about this guy. This is not what's important. And I don't think that we ever have to wrangle- It's editor, them. name names, I'm kidding. I, I feel so bad for them because I never actually talked to them about this after the fact to, 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 to claim victory years later or something, but- um, but I said, like, I was like, something's wrong here. Something like, I feel like I don't want to be like the bell ringer, but it feels like, like something has to be said there or there has, there has to be an intervention. And anti-fascists had said this for years, you know, and the, there's been anti-fascist groups, uh, particularly militant anti-fascist groups that had been kind of ringing this bell for so long. It says, if you don't do something about it now, it's going to be next to impossible to do something about it later. And I talk about that in the book that a lot of these kind of in utero groups in the like late 2000s didn't get the support from the left that they should have and, and then were trying to scramble then years later. I, I feel like I was just doing an, an article for NBC about this recent event where the Patriot Front, which is kind of an open fascist group was marching, I think uh, as many as 200 people in Philadelphia recently. But what I thought was sort of remarkable about it was that they picked like the least popular area. It was like the business district of 1045, you know, so like no, they expect no one to be there. 
But within honestly a few minutes, people were able to figure out who they were, get images of them up to social media and on like encrypted chat and get people out there to kind of push them out and did push them out. And that happened almost immediately. And I'm thinking back, I was thinking back to that indifference that I used to encounter that seems to totally limited now, not just that people know that it's threatening now and know it's worth something, but almost like people know what to do instinctually now. There's this idea of like the mechanisms of anti-fascism seem to be sort of embedded around us. So like, you know, in, in 2020, I was in Portland, but this was a cities all across the country. Protests came together by the thousands really, really quickly. And they actually built infrastructure really quickly. People, you know, created like these networks for car cooling or for um, paying people's bail money and getting them home after they were bailed out or getting people food and water and then like doing support for if people got too hot, things like that. Everything came together really quickly. And obviously there's years of organizing that goes to the base of those things. It doesn't come out of nowhere, but there also feels like things have changed. It feels like the situation is different now that people are more ready. How do you feel like it's changed over the last few years? We've had the Trump years, but now in 2021, do you think it's substantially different? Do you think people are more kind of ready to respond? Um, I think people are more aware of fascism existing in America. And it's an interesting, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, dichotomy, right? Like, I think the activist community is much more attuned. But um, at the same time, there's this tremendous apathy as well. Like that same indifference, like didn't go anywhere. And you see that in the minimization, even of January 6th. Like we have this collective amnesia about this attempted fascist coup uh you know there's like a rehabilitation of trump figures that's happening so it's like something we we really need to keep i mean like i'm so happy that 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 uh, i'm not like a, a biden stand but i'm very happy that there isn't a second trump term um but you know we're seeing like the absolute fascist takeover of, of the gop i mean there's really um so so little uh, separation between uh, the GOP and 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 outright fascism now, uh, and so there are a lot of concerning developments. One of my biggest concerns is like a a slide back into that indifference, back into that apathy. Um, but I do think, I mean, I agree with you that there's an activist community that's primed and and battle hardened now. Um, you know, it's like the women's march, right? Which, you know, the pussy hats, it's easy to lampoon, but it did lead a bunch of people to run for office. You know what I mean? Like participating in political action, becoming politically activated is sort of can have a snowball effect. Um, like Natasha participating in Occupy and having it change her life. Like, I think a lot of people became politically activated, myself included, in ways that... Um, they never had been before in their lives and uh, are never going back. Yeah, I know. And I think we're in a, we're, we're in a kind of complicated moment because, um, you know, we're at a moment where the, the courts are overseen by the far right. Um, most judges, Trump appointees, many, you know, the, we, we've, we've lived through a time where the left was so decimated for so many decades um, in any sort of formal political scenario. And, um, you know, it's only, you know, quite recently that we've seen any sort of leftists that we could, you know, in any way have any interest in, in any sort of offices. Um, so, you know, what, what, what we have relied upon is movement politics. And I think that's crucial. And they, there have been incredible, um, powerful movement politics and the uprisings last summer, I've not, you know, having been part of Standing Rock and Occupy, I've, I've still never seen anything like last summer. Um, and so I think we're in this weird moment where there is the potentiality of, of that amnesia and the, this sort of reliance of like, oh, well, Trump is in power now, but by the same token, the Democrats have 
the House and the Senate and are acting like they're a minority party and they're not, which I think is just one of those, uh, another affirmation that like, you know, we, we can't rely on leaders to do this. And so when Shane, you were talking about people in communities and in the streets, knowing what to do, that is that is at least building and is there, um, criticized as it is in, in certain ways. Um, but, but yet, um, you know, are we, and this is a question, are we always going to be reactive? Like, what does it mean to build community and space and a politics that isn't just defending against not only the far right, but the status quo? And I think it's really hard when you're always on the back foot as, um, you know, oppressed people certainly are, but those of us who aren't necessarily within oppressed communities, but are wanting to, you know, fight against the status quo we're, we're in, um, you know, what does it mean to, to build a politics when everything always has to be fighting back? Um, but one thing that I do always find interesting, which is when people do talk about Antifa, um, you know, in the mainstream, um, certainly, and it, it gets sort of spoken about as if it is the sort of like evil manifestation as opposed to an absolutely necessary set of practices um, is that no one I know who is engaged in this sort of activity as in direct action street defense and organizing only, I don't know anyone who only does that. These are also people who are working within communities for mutual aid groups, writing about different modes of oppression, teaching, thinking, working, living their lives in a way that is anti-fascist beyond just the street fighting against fascists, the ensuring the necessary work of shutting down fascism. These are always, for the most part, however much hard work that is, people involved in quite expansive political work. And I think that gets kind of lost in a mainstream map, uh, narrative of, you know, what is anti-fascism? Is it just fighting off the far right? Um, maybe as a kind of an identifier, that is what it is. But by the same token, I don't know many people who are involved in anti-fascist work only in terms of fighting off the far right. It's often people who have long been invested in community work and radical struggle, feminist struggle, queer struggle, black liberation struggle, indigenous struggle. Um, and I think these things get kind of atomized in a way that isn't fair to the kind of groundwork that, that makes possible the kind of event, um, as you were talking about in, in what happened in Philly yesterday, pushing off the far right. These aren't just people who are like, oh, we must only push off the far right. It's like, these are people that are in community with each other for a broader politics, like an understanding that anti-fascism isn't just ensuring the inheritors of Trumpism don't get more space. Like it's 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 anti-racist work, it's anti-capitalist work, it's feminist work, it's queer work, it's anti-anti-trans work. Um, and I think, yeah, so I think it's what what gets lost in a lot of these mainstream narratives is that this isn't the only thing that people who are fighting fascists in the street are doing. Yeah, it, it's almost like the 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 far right media sphere wanted to make the case for us by collapsing everything into Antifa, so everything suddenly became Antifa. But in reality, now things intersect so completely in a way that, like, you have mutual aid work, which supports other movement work, uh, which supports anti police work and anti fascist work as a part of that, and community defense work in general. So it does feel like there's sort of these pieces that have all found each other. In a way, when I like was organizing maybe 10 years ago, wasn't quite that complete. Things didn't, I think, feel like uh, cooperate in that way. You know, so, so one thing, one the, the biggest essay in my book is about the wolves of Vinland, which I spent an agonizing year and a half in their forums. Um, I totally don't recommend it. Um, uh, but like, one of go into weightlifting. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're, they're uh. Yeah, their weightlifting advice, please don't ever try it. It will destroy your kidneys and liver. It's a terrible idea. Um, but the way that they sort of, like they they make a sort of idol out of testosterone, at least what they think testosterone is, like they make patches of the chemical uh, or the molecular uh, symbol for testosterone. They coordinate, you know, I, I track down like a doctor who basically gives all their 
supporters testosterone treatment and stuff like that but they what they've done is they create this kind of obsessive masculinity and it it, it kind of comes back to 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 me that was something that was so underreported about the far right was was the centrality of misogyny and transphobia and transmisogyny to them and and how that motivated a really kind of vitriolic violence and Talia, you, you talk about this in your book is that there was a, a, a real definite difference in the way that you were treated uh, in masculine presenting or, or men, um, uh, anti-fascists and anti-fascist writers and things like that. There was a fundamental difference in that treatment. How do you think that misogyny helps fuel the far right or really give it that kind of violent energy? Yeah, um, I just wanted to make one, one point about anti-fascism uh, that kind of plays into this uh, too. I think, um, there are critiques of anti-fascism from the left that it is like solely reactive. Um, and I, I think that um, it's actually like, yes, it is it is a very specific and narrow form of defense, uh, but I think it's very necessary in and of itself. And, um, you know, there are people who are sort of solely working on the far right counter response. And, and I think that that's laudable work in and of itself. Um, but the other thing is that you know, the other thing that that's obscured in, in these ridiculous parodic media myths of, of anti-fascism um, and sometimes obscured by members of the left that are sort of uh, enmeshed in, in patriarchy and machismo in their own right is that anti-fascism is a very capacious um, uh, mode of, of action. It's not just blocking up and getting on the street and throwing punches. There are lots and lots of roles that you can play as an anti-fascist um, that don't involve street action at all. And I say this as someone who, you know, I'm disabled. I have agoraphobia that's really severe. It's definitely gotten worse over the pandemic. So all of the anti-fascist activism I do is behind a screen, whether that's infiltration, whether that's doxing, whether that's trying to get, you know, far right websites deplatformed. Um, from their hosting services and providers, whether that's letting people know that a hotel is hosting a far right conference, whether you know that's uh, um, you know writing and educating, like so, I think all of these are anti-fascist activities, and um, I think it's important to tell people that just because um, there is a space in the anti-fascist movement for you, if you want to find it, you know, if if you don't feel capable of getting out on the street and throwing punches, which is a laudable and awesome thing. Um, but is not the only thing that anti-fascism means. And I just want to make that, that, that quick point. Um, but, but, but to get back to your actual question, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to speak at a, a fast New York clip, but without alienating the North Carolina audience. Um, I, I just wanted to say, so uh, misogyny is a huge, 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 huge fucking gateway into the far right. I mean, it's, it's wide open. Um, and I think Misogyny, transphobia, and Islamophobia often serve like much the same purpose in far-right recruitment in that they're these sort of incredibly common ambient uh, uh, prejudices that are more or less socially acceptable and extant everywhere in everything we breathe and do in, in the United States. And so, um, you know, essentially what a lot of these content creators who funnel people into the far right do is sort of say, oh, the liberals, the commies are trying to take away your natural feelings about gender roles, about how Muslims are evil, about how trans people are gross. And, you know, um, we're going to justify those feelings for you and make you feel warm and good and connected. And then they draw you in deeper and deeper and deeper. And of course, all of these uh, prejudices are fatal in their own right, you know, uh, and have led to mass murders from the, the far right. Um, uh, but they also serve as important on ramps. And then once you're within these communities, like in these chat rooms that I was surveilling, um, you know, particularly this very innocuous and very wholesome series called Drag Queen Story Hour that involved like drag queens reading library books to kids has been a fascist obsession since like 2018. Uh, I think. kind of thing I could imagine. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so sweet and so wonderful. And it's also like, I remember just like a, a couple of um, weeks ago, someone responded to one of my tweets with a photo of a drag queen story hour and the caption, and then suddenly for no reason at all, the people voted Hitler into power. It's this idea of like, Jews are organizing sexual deviance um, in order to destroy the fertility of white men. 
uh, you know, that, um, you know, violent trans misogyny, violent misogyny, violent Islamophobia, and this idea of like a clash of cultures and, and them being the, the inheritors of the Crusades. I mean, the, like, these are also used to gin up outrage and continually sort of whip people who are already in the movement into a continual froth of dehumanization of their enemies and um, anger and vitriol. So they serve as both these prejudices because they are so ambient serve as useful recruitment fodder. And then they also serve as anger fodder. And I, and I will note that, yeah, like as, as a female uh, person, a, a, you know, woman um, uh, covering this stuff, a lot of the responses have been extremely sexualized, extremely uh, sexually violent. Um, you know, people talking about raping me with a gun, you know, lots of photoshops, stealing my bikini photos and impersonating me on 4chan, like just wild stuff that, 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 that male and male presenting people who cover this stuff, um, don't, don't receive. And, and, and I think it has a lot to do with the violence of their anti-feminism and how deeply central it is and how much of an engine it is for the movement. And I think it's severely underemphasized because the press corps uh, covering this movement is very male and very macho in its own right. Um, yeah, and I also, I do want to um, really thank Talia and Shane for their work because they've gone in the, in the most awful weeds in, into far-right chat rooms and far-right uh, forms of life in order to report from an anti-fascist space, uh, more so than I, I ever have actually. And, and so thank you guys for doing that. Um, true service to um, all of us. But you know, I think what, what Talia is saying is so crucial. And so, yeah, as I, as I mentioned, I'm in England right now, um, cocktail hour here. So I invite you all watchers in America to join early cocktail hour uh, or non-alcoholic non cocktail hour, if that's your desires, um, with me. But no, it is it is one of those things that it's um, the incredible transphobia that has become so normalized in the UK and in the US too. And certainly like the amount of um, extraordinarily violent transphobic um, trans hate laws that have been passed recently that are um, very much aligned with a sense of like that is part of the right wing white chauvinist white standing backlash that we are within um, and Jules Gill Peterson I think is a just uh, if if people are looking for good someone good to read on this stuff is is excellent about how the formation of of the racial other um, and the grounds by which we um, we, as in we guilty, the um, colonialist white people, um, had historically enabled uh, the kind of extraction and othering was not only the racial other, but the the, gen the, the assertion of misogyny, chauvinism, um, and and gender binaries as as we now live within them. Um, those those things all came together and, and cannot be ignored. And it's it's really, really unpleasant and uncanny to be in England that like people who who name themselves leftists and consider themselves part of any sort of uh anti anti-racist, anti-fascist struggle seem to think it's okay to be transphobic, um is just so disturbing. And it's it is that kind of space of like, oh yes, I will destabilize this, but hold this other sort of incredible, it, it, it kind of oppressive space, this norm as stable um, without understanding how these things are entirely interrelated um, is, is disturbing. And we have to be so cautious of the way that transphobia is part of a fas fascist regime mode of cementing and that like it can't just be oh no no I'm good on this bit I'm good on that bit like this is interrelated and it's historically interrelated so if we're going to undo it and fight it we can't just say oh no I'm 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 fine to just talk about class struggle I'm fine to just talk about anti-racist struggle like to talk about them in alienation from each other won't work 
and uh, produces other, other forms of violence as we see in Britain right now with the, the widespread transphobia amongst the self-defined left. Um, but, uh, but yes, and uh, just in terms of uh, if there are viewers here who do also use Twitter um, to get news and to communicate with each other because it can, it, it, can, it can be good for that. And you know, I, I learned about Talia's work through Twitter and I'm really, really grateful that I did. Um, cause you know, the technology, uh, isn't in and of itself an evil thing. It's just the way that it's not worker controlled and it's, it's explosive and extractive. Um, but if you are getting attacked by the far right and it's, and I too have dealt with the, um, you know, really quite elaborate rape descriptions of things that, that, that would, some of these people would like to enact only in their minds. If it's happening to you, turn off mentions for 48 hours. Don't, don't reply, don't go on the block by block, just turn it off for 48 hours. It's really important for your mental health. It's really important to like remove yourself from that. Just take the mentions off for 48 hours if you're getting attacked by the far right, because I assure you they're not saying anything that you need to hear. Because this is, again, that's why we, um, myself at least, and I know Shane also, and I know Talia, are interested or at least invested in um, deplatforming. And deplatforming also means like, if you're not interested in debating these people, because this isn't about a marketplace of ideas, it's about a struggle, a struggle against uh, an extension of the status quo, which is an oppressive one. Um, it's not about oh, I slightly disagree because you're a fascist and I'm an anti-fascist. It's fascism and we want to shut it down, but you can apply that to your own life. You don't need to hear these people if you're getting attacked online. You can just turn off your mentions and realize that you don't have to, you don't have to live that way. It doesn't have to be hurting you. Um, so yes, that was my little bit of uh, advice for people getting shit online, because I'm sure you will if you are uh, kind of strident and um, vocal anti-fascist online, especially if you are uh, female identified and female looking. Yeah, I, I feel like the, like the core message in anti-fascism is that community defense is more important than all else in those situations and that we have to like take a commitment to that. We don't owe them any kind of platform and deplatforming is a fundamental part of actually winning that, that kind of fight. I, so Talia has a, a heart out of three. So I wanted to get to one question that mentioned her from the chat. Um, so I said the question applies to all of you, but specifically directed at Talia. Uh, in reading your book and listening to you speak, it's very apparent how much of a target you were. Um, you sublimated that into action and creativity. Uh, do you have any skills to share that folks of marginalized groups can use to cope with what seems like uh, so much of the world hates us or part of us? How to not allow it to consume you and fill you with unproductive fear? A uh, bold assumption that my mental health is intact. Um, it is in shambles. Um, so I deal with a lot of unproductive fear, unfortunately. When I have been able to productively harness my fear is when I try to sublimate it into anger. I find anger and rage to be a very useful tool. I mean, especially in women, we're encouraged to never feel rage. And we're told to... Uh, push down our feelings of aggressiveness and confrontation, make ourselves smaller and weaker. And for myself, the ability to sublimate uh, some of the horror and the fear I felt into a useful and galvanizing anger. Um, I found that to be um, deeply useful in, in writing the book and in doing the work. Um, just get really fucking angry. That's that's my advice. It can be hard to do, but um, it's it's a useful thing to do. I also think I have a little more flexibility, so I, I can stay till three o five. I was actually just gonna type this to Talia on a private message, but I realized I can say it to the group. I'm uh, staying with my mom, who's had a, a pretty awful marriage that she's just leaving, and I keep trying to say, anger's not unproductive. Anger is actually really, really necessary and we should be able to harness that and use that. And it's really important and don't suppress that. Um, but 
yes, given that a lot of this this action is is done online and is um, about you know looking into who the far right are, who they're connected to, how these desirous spaces of sharing ideas um, and affirming ideas happens for the right um, and the kind of collective support on the left, you know, it, it's hard to do online. It's hard to support each other because what we're talking about is a different sort of communization, a different sort of mutual support and love um, that is harder to just enable with a retweet. So I'm just like, oh, I wish every wish every home could have a, a Talia to be like, no, anger, good. Fine, we do this and not not self hate. Do some anger. I'm like, oh, I wish I could transport you here right now. Um, sorry, I was just going to message that Charlie, but I was like, no, this this fine for the this fine for the crew. No, anger is a useful thing. Anger is something that can motivate work. It can motivate uh, struggle for justice. And we, I mean, there's so much to be angry about. It's very useful. And the more you use it, the less it consumes you. Um, I, I know. I know. There's there's questions from the chat. I just wanted to ask one question to 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 the group and people in the chat. I suppose can also type in and answer. Um, given that you know, I mentioned Occupy earlier. Um, one thing I think Occupy really failed at is putting um, the way in which capitalism is is also shaped around race and race um, was so left out of uh, the way we organize around Occupy, like you know, to a huge detriment. Um, but obviously the most uh, astounding struggle we've seen enacted has been black liberation struggle, I think in, in the US um, in our lifetime. Um, and yet when Antifa or anti-fascism is called upon, it's often framed and also kind of presumed as a kind of a, a white thing. And how do you guys deal with that? How do you ensure that like it's understood not that way and also ensure that we're not being just sort of like white anti-fascists? And I know that's tricky also in Portland where it's a very, very, very white place. It's known as such, yeah. I, I know that there's, there's I have one piece I think of that conversation that what's called anti-fascism tends to be white organizations. And then when they're not white organizations, they tend to not be called anti-fascism for whatever reason. So like black led self-defense groups, which are clearly anti-fascist by any measure um, have been left out of those histories. When you read a lot of those like particularly American histories of what anti-fascism looks like, you know, maybe starts with anti-racist action or like, you know, maybe some groups in the 70s, but it doesn't really talk about what the long, long history of that is uh, in Black Panthers and like- Exactly, the, the anti-fascist like, communities. Right. Well, they use the term, like the Panthers and mm -hmm. the Rainbow Coalition specifically organized around the term anti-fascism, but that's- yeah, yeah, the yeah, so I, I, mean, I think like opening up what that history actually is, there's also a certain kind of, and I know I remember when I encountered this when I was younger, that there was a sort of like, white accountability model of anti-fascism. I, I, I remember meeting with some folks from Malcolm X grassroots movement. This was many, many years ago, maybe 2010. And they made it really clear. They're like, well, we don't think that black folks and folks of color should join anti-fascist groups. We think that's white people policing white communities. And I think there's a, I, like, and while I don't ultimately maybe agree that like that would be the response, that's how the structure should go. I think there's a really key argument there about that. But one thing that the key in about Occupy is I feel like there was anti-fascist tension really heavily at Occupy because of the kind of populism that was allowed there where anti-Semitism creeped in, transphobia creeped in really heavily. Um, and that I think shows in a way that anti-fascism also has a piece of looking back at the weak points of the left because without having an intersectional framework, none of this actually makes sense. And you're totally opening yourself up to these really far right influences. Yeah, I mean, um, I'd also add that we are three white authors um, talking about anti-fascism at the moment. And that's something that you know I'm conscious of. Uh, I think there is, I think there are multiracial coalitions, like specifically, certainly here in New York, um, who engage in anti-fascist action. Um, but yeah, the image is like very prevailingly white. And um, to be honest, I, I mean, I think, I think many groups are white, um, uh, but like also a lot of it falls under this media portrayal of like, it's like, it's, it's funny, it's like in order to portray Antifa as the, this ultimate threat, the image becomes one that's super macho and super white. It's like, 
you know, like, it's like they have to be, you know, in order to present like a, a, a genuine social sort of, um, uh, a genuine, sorry, my, uh, uh, there's a baby here who's making some sounds. Uh, so, but um, in, yeah, just in, uh, in order to portray Antifa as the sort of like social threat, like threat to social norms that it, that it is like, uh, they've had to present it as mostly white because like how unnatural is it that mostly white people would be fighting uh, against uh, you know the far right assumptions that people assume that uh, all white people share. Totally yeah um, and yeah I, I kind of uh, it's also that tricky thing I was like I bring it up knowing that I'm only in direct conversation with white people so I know that none of us can really answer that question properly. Um, in terms of, uh, hello, friends in the attendee group. Um, Kim Kelly asked a question. Kim, Kim Kelly is one of my favorite authors who did another event. Kim, we love you. We love you, Kim, so much. You're amazing. Miss you. Um, who is lives in Philadelphia, so uh, maybe was around for the uh, actions yesterday, but um, is also just the most amazing woman. Everyone read her books. Uh, her book that's coming out and her writing, um, Teen Vogue and elsewhere. Uh, Kim asked, um, as journalists who who have contributed to high profile mainstream publications, which yeah, I guess we have, um, what are our most effective strategies for placing and actually publishing stories from an explicitly anti-fascist viewpoint? Um, I might pass this on to you guys because um, the intercept sort of lets me do what I, I want and it's it's left leaning. And then the other places I write for are sort of literary magazines and the nation, which is also left. Um, so I haven't written for somewhere that's like, but what's the other side for for a while? Um so I'll I'll kind of give Kim's question to you guys. I, I well one thing that I, I've that I'm always surprised by is it's actually larger publications that are gentler with me about that stuff um they sometimes i've been treated like okay you know we asked for an, if it's like an opinion thing that's that's one thing so they're like well we asked for an opinion we thought that that was the valid opinion so you can say your opinion and when it's like a left publication editors will want to argue with me about ideological points or, or strat strategic points and stuff which is not a problem that's not like bad but i've always been surprised but i i mean i've also i i have gotten it's hard to know what the impact is, you know, like, am I getting ghosted by editors after I publish something for a reason? Or was it just you know, circumstances in life? Uh, but I have been told by publications, like, look, I, even when it has nothing to do with anti-fascism, that that has been a liability. Um, and I, you know, I have people like Andy Doe that contact my editors and try to get them to break contracts and, and stuff like that. That has had an effect. But again, I'm always impressed by the amount of people that won't take those attacks seriously or don't think anti-fascism is an actual epithet. So I think I came into it thinking like, oh, I'm gonna be, you know, at the kids' table forever because of those sorts of things, and it didn't always turn out that way. Um, and so, but that ends up being where like I hold really tightly to the editors that say yes. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, like I don't have a job, and I've been on the market for a while and searching, and I, I think being openly, loudly, and radically anti-fascist like, might have a role in that. Also, I'm kind of a schlub, so there's that too. Um, you can never like really um, iterate reasons in a, in a like absolute shit show of an industry like ours um, where precarity is the rule, not the exception. Um, but the way I do it is like, I, I do write a fair bit of stuff that sort of I write about the far right and I write about it from sort of a, a very oppositional and, and, and not shy about it um, kind of a way. And, and um, I've written a, a, like that for the New Republic, which is left-leaning for the nation, which is left-leaning for MSNBC Daily, which is kind of left-leaning in a very hashtag resist sort of way. Um, the way I do it is like, I don't necessarily come out and say like, I'm writing this as an anti-fascist. I'll just like, bring up, I, I use a lot of history in my work. I always like to anchor things in historical anecdote, find parallels to, to current events. Um, you know, people 
as I, I write in my book, um, people are much more willing to laud heroes who are dead. Um, and so, you know, you can talk about past struggles that have been sort of framed, uh, uh, like, and, and, and understood and digested, uh, and then use them as analogs to contemporary events that people might be sort of blinding themselves about in terms of their gravity or in terms of, of the sort of intensity of the prejudice involved. So that's one couching strategy I use. Um, so I was going to hop through, we had a bunch of questions just come in. So um, someone asked, how do you respond to people who see what happened with the Patriot Front of Philly and say that fascists are no longer a threat? Um, so I mean, one of the things that's unique about the Patriot Front is that it's more like in the kind of group that would have existed two or three years ago before massive deplatforming and like anti-fascists blocking them and things like that shut down a lot of groups like Identity Europa, Vanguard America. Um, I mean, I think first off, like it's very clear. I mean, if they can amass 200 people and this is, an, this is not a crossover group. This is not like using conservative talking points. It's open neo-Nazi stuff. For them to amass 200 people all around the state requires money. It requires people coming in. It requires a lot of ideological coordination. I think that says something. But the other thing is, you know, 2020 was a mass radicalization event. You know, if we're looking at things like the demasking movements, stop the steal, the growth of QAnon. I mean, that they, they, they has so radically changed the composition of the public and shifted the beltway right further to the right, it tr shifted Trump's base further to the right. Uh, I think while like Patriot Front, uh, the Patriot Front is important and shutting down the Patriot Front is important. It is by no means the um, archetype of what the problem may look like in the coming years. And so I think that actually community defense groups are likely more important now. I mean, if you look at the history and it's pretty clear statistically that any time that the far right groups grow and then feel like they're in a moment of retreat, like say Biden, you know, that how, however they think about him was elected or anti-fascists put them back, push them back or their deplatform, platform you see them like seemingly impulsive acts of violence, like terroristic kind of old school terroristic violence. And so that really concerns me and that's what I think community defense groups and mutual aid groups that sustain them and kind of coordinated community groups, that's so important now, as important as it was over the last four years, it's just as important now. Uh, yeah, I mean, look at the Tea Party, right? I mean, that 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 comes with, um, like, like pff, radical movements tend to thrive in moments where they feel politically exiled. Uh, you know, and, and also, as I like say a lot, I mean, the terms on the right are just like very Manichaean right now. Like they're like, OK, like our opposition is literally blood drinking demons who rigged a presidential election. And these are mainstream views on the right. Um, that's a that's a direction like with lots of big red signposts leading directly like towards violent altercations, as we saw on January 6th. And as you know, we're continuing to see on the streets. The other thing about the right is that even the far right, like like Nazis, like have a lot of dark money behind them. And the left were perpetually broke and begging you for donations on Eventbrite to like subsidize us coming in to talk to you. Um, like it, you know, there just isn't an analog on the left as much as like like Tucker Carlson or whatever wants to say, like, oh, Raytheon is woke now. Uh, and like oh, like the military is woke. It's not like no one with any appreciable amount of money is, is like leftist in any way. Um, whereas like VDARE has a castle. Like VDARE owns a castle. That's a Nazi publication. And I think about that sometimes. So it's like one of the things that we're going up against is like they'll always have money and they'll always have sources of money because there are people who find the foot soldiers of fascism useful um, to retaining their, their fortune or or just because of their personal beliefs, like the Tanta network was funded by um, uh, by an heiress. Um, I forget, like some eccentric heiress to, uh, of, of some major industrial family, I forget. Um, that's the radical anti-immigrant network. So, you know, we're, we're facing those with a lot of money um, and money means resources and money means ability to organize and ability to recruit. Um, and so no, the threat is not going away. If anything, like maybe there's this moment of scattering and the, the sort of January 6th prosecutions maybe not knock things back a little, but it's always only temporary. And like also like the continual environment of accelerationism and stochastic terror in these circles means that, um, you know, it only takes one person with a gun to devastate a community, 
to inflict terror and hate. And it's really a matter of time before the next far right terror event happens. Uh, unfortunately, and I, I always feel like a Cassandra saying this, but it, it to me is true. Um, no, no, totally. And, um, you know, it always annoys me when I'm at um, the sort of academic conferences with with a lot of sort of, um, you know, aging libs. And they're like, well, you know, what, what happened to the left? I'm like, well, there was a generation lost to neoliberalism when at exactly the time, lots and lots and lots of money was being fueled into um, conservatism and the kind of convergence of liberal politics into bending to the far right has meant, I mean, centrism is a, a, an appalling framework to put oneself in because how can you be a centrist with a fascist? But that's what we're living with. That's what we've seen in the UK. That's what we've seen in the US. That's what we've seen in Germany. Um, any given space that's been like, oh no, no, we're terribly worried about the far right. The far right is very worrying. So we'll basically do exactly what they want so that they don't get into power. And I'm like, yes, but now everyone's anti-immigrant and borders are fiercer than ever. And um, the the cruelty of austerity and um, anti-movement of people, extraordinary movement of capital um, has just been established. And often in the name of a certain anti-fascism, which is why we have to be cautious when we use the term and say like, no, no, this is our anti this is anti-fascism that is also anti-racism, also feminist, also queer, also pro-trans rights, also pro the movement of human bodies and human people when we need to survive, also pro kind of livability of human and non-human life, um, cannot be confused with like, oh, just to push off the far right, we'll have this convergence to give them what they want so they're not technically in power but everything they fucking want gets to win um it's not the bbc so i can say fucking um but yes um so i was... i have to uh i have to head out but i just want to i want to leave yeah, we didn't one question sorry uh i i just want to leave uh with one thought that this is something that, that that I talk about in my book, but but I, I feel like it's useful because one of the, the questions was about how to like normalize the term Antifa. Um, first of all, like Antifa, anti-fascism, you can use both. Anti-fascism tends to be something that's a little more palatable to libs. Um, but I think that like one of the movement, uh, one of the arguments that it's really important to defang that like I really detest and despise with every fiber of my being um is this argument about the marketplace of ideas and how deplatforming nazis is uh you know a terrible mistake um and like surely we can simply reason them out of these holes and what about de-radicalization and why must you be so violent and so insistent and i just want to emphasize that to me these arguments uh, essentially all come from the same place, which is, look at me. I'm so tolerant. I'm so amazingly tolerant that I can even tolerate a Nazi. I am so brave and so smart and so beautifully smug in my own tolerance that I care more about the ability of a Nazi to speak in a public square or a, a college campus than I am about the Black, queer, Muslim, Jewish, trans uh, uh, victims of this kind of speech and the actions that it inspires. Um, it is an argument of smugness. It is an argument that is fundamental, fundamentally uncaring and dismissive about the many marginalized groups that these uh, far right movements directly threaten. Um, and so when you encounter that argument, I, I, I encourage you to fight it as hard as you can because it is deeply destructive and unbelievably and perniciously widespread. Punch a Nazi every day in your head, in your heart, online, from behind a screen, in person, wherever. Um, there is a role for you in the anti-fascist movement, no matter what your capabilities, time, uh, you know, disability status or lack thereof, um, you know, does for you. Uh, you can be in the front lines. You can be 
uh, doing research, you can be organizing, you can be making food drives, um, but there is a role for you and you are welcome. And please come join us. Talia out. Bye. Uh, thanks so much, Talia. Um, oh, and gonna... buy Shane's book. It's really good. Yeah. Buy Shane's book, yes. Thank you. Um, I didn't pick up below something that Talia said. I, I, there's this notion that speech is just about speech or that like when they're speaking, this is about communication, when it's about organizing, it's about building things. And you know, when, when Richard Spencer is allowed to speak, he's allowed to build something so as to have a consequence. They want to achieve something and he has to have access to those things to do it. And a lot of these fights over that are called free speech or a left or call a leftist attacks on free speech really are proxy battles about things. You know, on the campus, a lot of these battles are about fighting for what we want to spend their tuition dollars on or what we want to have access to building education systems on. These are not just about this one person. These are about whether or not we have control of our communities. And so in a way, I, I've been thinking about this like the concept of cancel culture is, is, is sort of an extension of the critique of Antifa, uh, which most of people don't know what Antifa is. So they're not really critiquing anything. It's critiquing a monster they created. But, you know, in a way they, sh they are right. There is a cancel culture. We are canceling them. They should be fucking scared because we are like taking back their power to build their own spaces where they're unaccountable to anyone. We're taking back resources. We actually are pushing back on their ability to harm us because we actually do have a vision, right? Like we actually have a vision of what the world could be and they have to fucking lose if we are gonna win it. And that, I mean, I, I think like there's this, this accusation that comes in that anti-fascism is illiberal and that it doesn't play the rules of liberal democracy. But the reality is that the state we live with now has failed to actually support most people, marginalized communities. And so we are doing something different. And in doing that, we're not, I think, shying away from the fact that we actually have to push back on like enemies of what our goals are. Totally. It's one of those weird things with the free speech debate. Um, I put in like this little essay I just wrote for dissent that was like, um, and I'll, I'll say this and then maybe we take a question and then because yeah, like you let me know what's good, Jane. But um, yeah, a lot of people end up sounding like the state when they talk about free speech. They're like, oh no, no, but what should the rules be? Where's the line? How do we have these completely clear and perpetuitous set of rules of like what speech is permissible? Not? I'm like, why suddenly are all these communities that allege to all these liberals that allege to care about communities suddenly so invested in having rules in perpetuity when they pretend to be interested in the struggle and a politics. It's like, if you have a politics and you're living by it, um, there's this the reasonable presumption that you're able to say, oh no, because it's against that. So this idea of like, no, but we have to have these set rules of what is permissible speech or not. And I'm like, well, what if we're struggling against it in the moment we understand that speech is dynamic and complicated and I can't give you the line. I just can't. I can't tell you what is or isn't in perpetuity permissible speech, but on the campus, in the community, in the streets we're living in, what speech is promoting the most oppressive versions of organizing and terrorizing the most oppressed people. Let's try and deplatform that. And maybe you don't need to sound like the state in asking for rules. Um, is that weird feeling that I have about how this this dis discourse has um, evolved? Um, but yes, that is that is all I have to say. But we, I can answer questions. But also, I know there's a post. There, there, um, were, there was two. I was going to try to roll two, two questions into one um, that I thought like they sort of had like an overlapping question in a way. So. One was, do you see antifascism as a structure that encompasses struggles against racism and case, against misogyny, or do, or, or do you see these as overlapping but distinct structures? Um, and then another question was a question about Occupy and the kind of entryism that had happened to someone's local Occupy. Um, and what about that duality? Did Occupy unknowingly stray into red brown alliance at times? You know, the, the reason I feel like these actually have overlapping questions is it's a lack of an intersectional approach to oppression, to anti-capitalism, anti-fascism. So I think that those are totally overlapping and not necessarily distinct. You know, so in that I always thought that that fascists, particularly the really ideologically driven movements, do have a sort of like nightmarish mirror of the left in that they actually are intersectional in a way. 
They want to reify patriarchy. They want to reify gender roles. They want to reify racial case structures. They actually want to go at it in those ways. So the only way to actually counter them is for us to actually see those things as overlapping and interlocking and to see you know, our liberation bound up with one another. That's the only actual way to deal with it. And the, with Occupy, and this happens with a lot of movements is that by being so kind of narrowed in on something and not seeing larger context, it allows for entryism and, and Occupy was a good example. And I was involved in Occupy, Occupy Rochester and, and down at Zuccotti. Um, but, and so I don't want it to sound like an anti-Occupy thing or like looking back, we're not as happy, but like it's the populism of it just showed the real weak points of the left. Um, so, and around anti-Semitism and lacking a clear class analysis there um, by not taking anti-Blackness the role of police very seriously, by not talking about um, colonialism in a, in a, you know, this idea of occupying space and, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of reifying a pioneer spirit in there um, that, and then trying to look back at older American populist movements without looking at the actual context they existed in. There was a lot of use of, of the kind of feminization of capital, this idea that, you know, um, bankers were a feat or they were perhaps Jewish rather than what they're actually doing financially and functionally being the issue. There's a lot of those kind of populist narratives. And when you lack, I think, an idea of how those things intersect through like ongoing educational work and, and working and, and organizing in multiple spaces, you're just, you're not gonna see, get a strategy that sees those things in the way that we have to, if we want to create a struggle that functions against it, and I, anti-fascists have often, I, I, I interviewed Rose City Antifa a number of times, and they talked about how, like, particularly early on, like they had campaigns that were always at odds with the left because they were coming at these entryist points. You know, people brought in through conspiracy theories or who have been on like the edge of art circles and things like that. And so the left is just as vulnerable. So without a real strong intersectional approach, you don't, don't have the ability to create any kind of struggle that I think can actually see goals. Agree. <laughs> um, should we, what's, yes, I uh, mainly just always agree with Shane. So buy his book. Um, and if you can't, um, I'm sure there'll be a free version online circulating somewhere, uh, but no, do could support his work. Um, I probably have to bounce in a second, but can like, yeah. Well, yeah. we just going to wrap things up. I, I So thank you so much for being here and writing the brilliant forward for it. Um, it really helps uh, uh, open it up. Tasha was my editor before. And so I always feel like you're sort of there supporting me, which is so wonderful. Um, and your book was such an inspiration for putting this together. Um, yes, please uh, pick up the book. Um, it, I feel like it chronicles the last few years really well. It chronicles particularly the kind of desperation that we're in, but also what overcame that. I spent a lot of time talking about anti-Semitism, including on the left, including about Occupy and some of the problems there. Um, spent a lot of time talking about the sort of intoxicating masculinity of a lot of these groups and uh, the way toxic patriarchy fuels them. Um, and uh, I hope you all like it and make sure to pick it up from Firestorm and also donate to the Eventbrite in the chat so that speakers can get um, some money to for gas for home and things like that. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, both Shane and Natasha and Talia who had to dip out a bit early. Uh, this was a robust conversation and thanks so much for everybody who was in attendance for um, submitting really engaging uh, questions that our speakers were able to respond to. Um, I did just drop links to everyone's book there in the ch chat. So hopefully if folks haven't gotten a chance to check that out yet, they can. Um, Shane's book is Why We Fight. Um, yeah, and thanks so much, everyone. Uh, stay vigilant and in you know, the words of Talia, punch a Nazi every day. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. <laughs> all right bye everyone thanks for having bye, me everyone. good night thank you all so much bye. Bye.